Excellent. All right. So cool. Ahead, Thanks, Danito. Appreciate that. Here, I, I know I shared my screen at first. I got to make sure I share with sound because I got some sound stuff going on. There we go. So we'll get there. Well, hey, welcome everyone. It's good to good to have you. Uh, good to see you today and get to talk about Ecuador and some of the the fun, the experiences, the adventures that uh, Tucson Audubon, not just myself, uh, Tucson Audubon had in Ecuador, um, the land of hummingbirds and tanagers and ant pittas and the equator and ah, so many cool things. Um, and so I've been uh, looking forward to sharing some of that with you all. Some of you have been to Ecuador before, some of you haven't, some of you uh, haven't been to South America. Like I, I'd never been to South America before this. So a lot of it was new for me. And uh, I have to say that I'm already looking forward to my next trip back to Ecuador. It was, it was beautiful. And I get to share a little bit about it with you today. As I was putting this together, I realized this is the most, um, the most PowerPoint slides I've ever had for a 45 minute presentation. So we'll see what we get through. And I'm not going to be able to hit everything that we experienced, but hopefully some of the highlights and then we'll get the, you know, if you have any questions or anything afterwards, we'll definitely uh, have some time for that. So here, here's a, a picture of our group along with some, some extras as well. But this is at my favorite spot of the whole trip, Refugio Paz de la Aves. This is, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we, as I get to that spot in our itinerary. Um, but you can see the, right here that we even let the little spot in the midst of our group picture for the Andean cock of the rock right there between Lissa and Jake. Uh, this is, uh, our, like I said, our group plus a few others. We had 10 uh, participants from Tucson Audubon go on the trip along with myself and our uh, local leader right here, Edison. And Edison is from right in Ecuador and leads uh, burning field trips all around South America. Just an amazing, amazing guide. Uh, really great to work with. And then over here, kind of on the right side is Rob Ritma. He's from Saberwing Nature Tours, and he was our tour guide. Uh, Saberwing's been one of our great partners for many years, since 2018. Uh, Rob and I have a great friendship and relationship, and uh, he um, put all this together for us. And you can see if... Uh, a few people who are on the on the virtual talk right now with us. I, I know I saw Scott, and I'm pretty sure Paul and Lisa were on, on or um, are with us today. And I think I saw Peggy and Serpa. And then there is also John, and I don't know if John's on the call with us today. And Amy and Jake and Lissa. And so we and, oh, and David. David's over here on the right, blocked by my pictures. Can't forget David. David Ingram is right over here. And so we just had a blast. Um, not all of us knew each other to begin with, but some of us kind of knew each other some better than others. But uh, by the end of the trip, like uh, I, I'd have to say it was like the best group I've ever been on a long trip with before. Been on a few of these now. And uh, it was just, it, it went really well. Very smooth. Uh, wonderful group of people uh, starting with our leaders, Edison and, and Rob. And uh, so... Like I said, we did this with Saberwing Nature Tours. Um, it's something that we put together with them uh, about a, a year ago, year and a half, a year ago, something like that. But we have more opportunities coming. Uh, we have another uh, Saberwing trip that's going to Panama next uh, next year and doing some work on setting something up for 2025 as well. So I'll talk about that at the end, about some other possibilities uh, that you could um join us on an international trip in the future. We partner with other companies as well. Uh, but of course, we have to uh, focus on Saberwing today since that's who we did this trip with. They just did a fabulous job, really easy to work with. And uh, so the way we'll lay this out is um, we had two weeks that we spent in Ecuador. And I'll just kind of work through like each place that we went to, some of the highlights, some of the birds that we saw, uh, some of the... Uh, the stories that came out of that and uh, work chronologically through that. And then we'll have some time for some questions at the end. But thought I would just start with an overview of a, of a map. Everyone loves maps, right? To kind of see where we're at. This is from our uh, eBird trip report. 
And so on the eBird trip report, so many different facets that you can kind of sort through there. You got maps, you got checklists, you got bird species lists from locations. You have all of our pictures that all of us have, have put into eBird. I know, uh, so we're fresh back, ba barely over a week back from Ecuador. Not all of our pictures have been processed yet. Uh, I know Peggy, I think she took a million pictures and she probably only has a couple hundred thousand that she's went through. I'm over-exaggerating just a little bit, but not too much. Uh, but as um, as those all get fleshed out, I'll, I'll have Danito share a, our trip report, the link in the email so you can go and look at that if you want to. Uh, just kind of see the different locations we went to and what we saw at each spot. But you can see Ecuador, it's kind of in Northwestern South America. Um, between Colombia and Peru, a uh, small country, but uh, uh, for the size of the country, it's an enormous variety of bird species. It's just incredible how many bird species are in this small little country. And we only went to a small portion of it. You can see um, we didn't go anywhere in the south. We didn't really go uh, into the Amazon basin uh, at, at all, and we didn't go to the coast. Uh, but even though we didn't hit those spots, we still saw over 500 species of birds. Incredible. Just incredible. So here's a little bit more of a blown up map of Ecuador and where we went. We started in Quito. And Quito is right in this valley in between um, in the Andes Mountains. So you have uh, high points of the Andes on the west and then high points of the Andes on the east. And so we started... Uh, by going west from Quito and going up over the mountains, spending some time in some high um, elevation spots on the west side, and then drop down into some lower levels, like around two, 3,000 feet on the west side at Rio Solanche. And then we came back to Quito, which sits at about, I, oh, I'm going to get, I think it's around 8,500 feet elevation, maybe 8,000. Someone will probably correct me on that in the chat, but I think it's around eight, eight, 8,500 feet. So we came back to Quito and then we went over to the east side, way up high, all the way up to 14,400 foot elevation up at the antennas where we're looking for seed snipe. And we'll, we'll talk about that for sure. Our lovely seed snipe and then drop down, uh, onto the, the Eastern kind of not quite lowlands, not quite Amazon basin. But um, again, like around the uh, 4,000 foot elevation range. So the reason that there's so many birds concentrated in this area is because of the varied levels of elevation and the different uh, types of habitat that we went through, whether it's cloud forest or paramo, uh, wet paramo, dry paramo, which is kind of like high elevation grassland areas. Um, and... Um, Elfin forest was another habitat that we went to, but each of these different elevations, you would have different bird species. And on either side of the Andes, you have another set. So it's just, it's kind of like the United States where like on the Rocky mountains, you have, you know, black headed grosbeaks, speaks. And on the Eastern side, you have the rose breasted grosbeaks. speaks. Um, same thing like a, in Washington state where uh, on the West side, you would have um, chestnut back chickadee, on the east side, you you wouldn't have chestnut back chickadee. You'd have something else over there, uh, white-headed woodpeckers or grouse or something like that. So whenever you have a mountain range and separated, uh, lends itself well to a lot of variety of bird species. So that's kind of how we did first the west side, then the east side. And we started in Quito. Quito, uh, there's a lot of people in Quito. I was not prepared for how big of a city Quito was or is. Uh, millions of people live in Quito. This is just a, a little sample picture that I took out of the bus as we were driving around through the city. But it's huge. And it took forever to, you have to drive through this big valley to get up out of there. And it just, uh, it took a while uh, every time we had to drive out of Quito. Uh, but it's also an amazing city. On the last day, we'll get into this. Um, our last day, we had a tour of the city. Uh, but one thing I was just surprised at how big it was. Fairly easy to get around to, even though it took a while. Uh, you know, it seemed like just a, a normal city that we would drive through. Like for Phoenix, it just you see billboards in Spanish. It 
we'll sometimes actually see billboards in Spanish in Phoenix too. But, uh, you know, it's just you know, not that different really than what we would expect from a large city uh, for the most part. Um, but it was very large and I was not quite prepared for that. So on the first day, actually even, so we had a kind of extension on the very first day that we were there. The tour hadn't actually uh, even really started yet. But on the first day, we went up into uh, the western uh, highlands of the Andes on the west side of Quito to a place called uh, Reserva Biologica Yanacocha. So Yanacocha Reserve. And had our first introduction to the birds of Ecuador, specifically hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, like, so when you think of South America, when you think of Central America, uh, the first thing I think of is hummingbirds. I don't know if that's true for you or not, but it definitely was for me. And that's one of the biggest draws for this whole trip was that um, the promise of seeing 60 plus hummingbird species. We ended up, I think, with 67. And we had our really first taste that that day at Yanacocha. And so we had uh, the really cool thing about these hummingbirds is, is their names. Their names are almost even cooler than what they look like. And what I, I have a female buff wing star frontlet here that we're looking at. You can see why it has the, the name buff wing. It has that little patch right there, both on the male and female. Um, star frontlet, I don't really know why it's called a star frontlet. It's just one of those things. We have star frontlets and saber wings and uh, wood nymphs and um, sunbeams. It's so many crazy names of these hummingbirds. Here's another, here's a shining sunbeam. This happened every day that we are out on a tour. We, at the end of the day, we talked about what was our bird of the day. And the, the bird of the day on, on this first day was the shining sunbeam for me. Um, uh, Peggy Steffens got, a, I think she got a really cool picture of the back of the shining sunbeam. And let me see if I can pull that up real quick. I think I, I think I have it. Boom. Right. Right. Oh, did I close out my eBird thing? No, there it is. Okay. So this is our eBird trip report. And if we go to species with photos, you'll get to see all the different birds that we saw all, all the different pictures that we put in here. So let me find, let me find the shining sunbeam and you got to see the back of this bird. Here it is. Oh yeah. Peggy got a great picture. So you can see, this is why it's called shining. It's got like this rainbow, uh, on the back. And so like, if you get a picture, like sometimes you, I mean, for the most part, whenever you take a picture of a bird, you want to get the, the front of the bird. Uh, but some of these birds, like you want to see, you want to see the rump, you want to see, you want to see the backside. And so I know Peggy was really on it, trying to find that backside of a shining sunbeam and she got it right there. So I had to, had to share that with you. I did not get the back, but this is, this is what I got. So shining sunbeam. And then we have things like great sapphire wing. You can see how big and long those wings are on the sapphire wing. It's beautiful birds. And so at Yanacocha, that's what we really uh, started with. It was just an introduction to the birds of the area, specifically the hummingbirds. And um, it reminded me of what it's like to be a new birder. Uh, some of you, you would consider yourselves new birders right now. If you come to Tucson, you're like, holy cow, this is like information overload. And how do I, how do I understand what all these are? Yeah, that happens to all of us. And that's what really happened to me in Ecuador. I started with keeping the eBird list for the group, but by like day three, I think I, I said to Rob, Hey, I can't do this anymore. I had too much going on. Like I can't process all this and I'm missing birds on the eBird list. And I'm missing birds when I see them. And so he graciously took the, uh, the eBird reporting from me and, uh, yeah, it's information overload, all these hummingbirds. But it wasn't just hummingbirds. It was also an introduction to brand new families that we don't have here in the United States. So in the United States, we do not have ant pittas. I don't know how many of you have ever seen an ant pitta before, but they are these little birds with hardly any tails with long legs and they hop on the ground and they're very, very secretive. So one of the, another cool thing about birding in Ecuador is that a lot of these different reserves 
they um they they have guides who take you to different locations at the reserve where they feed uh, ant pit as worms or call them in. And so we'll have some examples of this later on in the talk, but this is our first introduction to ant pittas. And, and so we were led by a guide to a couple spots where there's equatorial ant pittas. And I think there's also Tawny ant pitta at Yanacocha. This is an equatorial ant pitta, beautiful bird. And um, you go out into the forest and you all gather around, you look down into this pit area and then they either call it or throw out uh, worms. And then you just wait and all of a sudden it kind of pops up there and you get your picture. So it's pretty cool, pretty awesome. So when we were going around uh, Ecuador, we had an awesome bus and an awesome bus driver. We'll introduce you to Omar here in a bit. But this bus right here was what took us around to all these different places. And, uh, it was, it was actually really comfortable. I fell asleep on it quite a bit. Uh, each one of us were able to uh, have our own window seat. And, um, it's amazing where this bus went and where our bus driver was able to get us to different locations on the, uh, kind of off, not quite off-roading, but sometimes it felt like off-roading, um, it, yeah, and a coach actually on our way back, we had to take a different route because there was an accident uh, on our route that we took in. And so we went through like um, these back roads through like um, uh, a, a landowner's property and uh, up and down these these hills. It was insane. Well, the next day we went to uh, uh, we actually were leaving Quito. Uh, for good for a little while and we continued to go west and we went to a place called zero loma which again is up in the the high uh elevation in the west andes mountains and we're on this you can see this kind of dirt road here that we were on not a very wide road uh, but we had our first introduction to kind of um what it was like to drive around on some of these back roads we came up and we we're trying to get around this car that was for some reason just parked in the middle of the road and so Edison got out of the bus to check on this car and evidently up a uh, up higher on this road, there's kind of like a, a town, a, a little town, a little park area where they had done a big uh, celebration the night before. And um, evidently these people in the car had maybe drank too much and they passed out just in the middle of the road. And so Edison was trying to get them to move off the road. Uh, to no avail, our bus was able to just squeak on by barely on that right side. Um, but yeah, they were just they just stopped right in the middle of the road and were passed out there. And as we went up, we came into the up to the town and there was a truck parked there. Edison had to get out and talk to locals, finally got the truck moved so that we could get up to Zero Loma. It was quite the uh, quite the event and uh, it was just kind of a, a funny introduction to uh, some local issues that were up there. But at Zuraloma, we saw more hummingbirds. And this time I saw my, well, actually it was probably my second favorite hummingbird of the trip. My favorite was an Ecuadorian hill star, which I don't have a good picture of, but this is my second favorite. This is sword build hummingbird. One of the two birds that I really, really, really wanted to see on the, on the whole tour. So we got to run into sword build hummingbird, luckily not run into it, but to, but to see it. And, um, just uh, again, an amazing assortment of, of hummingbirds, at this location. So here's a little video clip I'm going to play for you just to give you an example of, uh, what it looks like to be in front of all the hummingbird feeders at Zero Loma. So here we go. Let me play it. I don't know if you could tell or not, but there were, those were uh, all hummingbirds like moving around, not butterflies. Or there might have been some butterflies, uh, around, but it was um, definitely tons of hummingbirds at Zero Loma. And with a lot of these different reserves that we went to, they all had a bunch of hummingbird feeders. 
uh, many of them had uh, banana or fruit feeders as well. And then a, a set of trails around. And I mean, you could just see like the the plants that are here, just amazing assortment of plants. I know uh, it was kind of hard sometimes to, as we were walking on trails again, uh, some of us like, <laughs> well, maybe Lisa or Sirpa that, hey, you know, let's keep moving. Like uh, we, but they got all these beautiful flowers and plants to take pictures of. And it was just really uh, a little bit overwhelming the first couple of days. As you can see, there are all those hummingbirds and plants. So also here at Zuraloma, we uh, took a, a bit of a, a walk, um, which turned into a fairly steep hike. As Edison called it, it was an undulating hike. Undulating for us means kind of up and down. Well, actually, it turned out the undulating for Edison was just straight uphill. And I know it, that was a big surprise to all of us as we we're going up. But this is kind of what the trail looked like as we we're going up. And the, the reason that we went and did this because we wanted to see a very specific screech owl that was up in this area. White-throated screech owl. It was definitely worth it. It's a great picture that Peggy took up at Zero Loma. Uh, way up, I had to do this big hike, kind of wore a few of us out. Normally, we, we didn't do a whole lot of hiking, but when we did do hiking, it almost always involves some up or downhill. Um, many times, on you know, the, the trails were fairly well groomed, but still pretty tough at times. But, um, you know, that's the thing with Ecuador is that there's so much up and down, hardly any flat spots, but, um, every hike was well worth it, including this one for this owl. Everyone loves owls. We had a few different owls on the trip. Uh, this was our, yeah, this was our first one that we had and, um, yeah, it's it beautiful. So after uh, doing Zero Loma, we then went down to our lodge for the next three nights at Septimo Paraiso. Uh, I, I didn't get a picture of the inside of my room, but even better was outside kind of courtyard area where after uh, a day of birding, we come back and you see this big chair here on the left. I, I pretty much claimed that chair and... Um, from when we got back, whatever time it was, four o'clock, whatever, you'd probably find me in that chair having a cerveza. Uh, just a wonderful spot to hang out. Um, you know, kind of had some, uh, I guess, Barbie looking furniture, but uh, I had to take this picture and send it to my daughter. She loved it, made her want to go there. Uh, but the lodging at all of our different places was really good. It was really good. Um, uh, Ecuadorians, uh, love to host and show their hospitality. And so Septima Prizo was a great example of that. So when we got to this spot, it was already pretty late. It wasn't dark yet. Uh, and so since it wasn't dark, a few of us wanted to go birding. Like I'm not going to let, um, some daylight burn when I'm in Ecuador without going to look for birds, at least at the beginning. And so we got out of the, the bus, spent some time at the feeders. And all of a sudden I started hearing this weird noise, this weird noise. Like, what is it? So I'm going to play the weird noise for you. And then I want you, maybe someone has a guess as to what it is. All right. So here's the weird noise. <laughs> all right. It's going to come again in about 20 seconds. But imagine hearing that while you're out at this place right here, you have to go look for that, right? You can't just let that go by. So it's gonna come again here pretty soon, I think. Here it comes, I hope, I think in about 10 seconds. Okay, that is rad, right? Like. I got to go find out what that is. Anyone have a, a quick guess? Feel free, free to unmute yourself. And anyone have a guess? Maybe a POTU. Oh, POTU. That's kind of like, as I was hearing, I was like, huh, I wonder if that's a POTU. I knew it had to be something with like a, a strong voice, something that felt big, right? Wasn't a POTU though. Here's what it was. Umbrella bird. Oh, umbrella bird would have been awesome. Oh. That would have been really cool. But this was cool too. A waddled wand. 
So this is a really this is this picture was taken from a long big distance. And I wish I would have taken a picture of how far away it was. So there was a few of us. I think it was uh David, I think Scott was there, Peggy was there. Uh I'm trying to remember maybe Alyssa. I can't remember if Alyssa was with us. Uh but we went out kind of to the parking area. We're trying to figure out, okay, what direction is it coming from? And we went out the parking area and kind of looking around. We had a bunch of different birds all around us. We had um, a thrush, we Ecuadorian thrush. We had um, Chibi Vireo and a bunch of other stuff. But I was so focused on trying to figure out what this was. And there's this open area that looked out on this big ridge. And way up on the ridge was like a, like a palm tree. And then from this palm tree in front of it, as you can see on these these sticks right here, kind of broken snags, was something that looked out of place. I put my binoculars up there, and sure enough, you could barely with with my uh, Lycan Noctavids, I could barely make out the blue and the yellow and just this big black body of this bird, and it ended up being a wattle guan. And when it made that call, you could see it like I took this picture as it was stretching out its neck and making that sound. I tell you what, that was one of the things I was most proud of this whole Ecuador trip was finding what was making that noise. And, uh, that was really exciting. So you never, you know, even though the, the, the trip to Zero Loma and all those other places is over and we're supposed to just be resting, it pays to just keep birding. So that was pretty fun. All right. So the next day, I know we're only a few days in here. The next day was the best day of the whole trip because we were going to Angel La Paz's place to look for Andean Cock of the Rocks. We were going to the lek. And the lek is where these birds kind of congregate and go through their breeding rituals, their dances and all of that. And so we were going there in the morning and I was so stoked for that because that was like the biggest thing that I wanted to do in, in going to Ecuador. So I took a little video of us walking up to the blind where the lek was at. And so we'll watch it here. And uh, the best thing to do is to turn your sound up and listen to these cock of the rocks. You actually won't see any, any of the cock of the rocks in the video, but you'll just be hearing them. And then also, I don't want to talk over it, but as we walk up to the blind, you'll hear like this iconic kind of jungle trilling sound. And it's going to be uh, a giant ant pitta that is calling as well. So listen to the sounds and just the anticipation of what it's like to walk up to this lek. Here we go. That's the amphitheater right there. Uh, it was just like the anticipation was like on fire for me as I was walking up there to that that like and just hearing like i i didn't really know what to expect when it came to like hearing the birds and that was actually one of the coolest things of the whole trip was just learning uh what all these different weird uh ecuadorian birds sound like because like i've seen the pictures but i don't always listen go to like xeno canto and like listen to the different calls and everything and so i had I, I wasn't expecting so much uh, noise coming from the cock the rocks as we walked up there. Got to show pictures though, because like we're mostly visual people rather than audio people, even though that's that that's important too. But here's a I, I wanted to put one of my own pictures of a cock the rock up, but I just um, I got some decent pictures, but like I had to go with this one. This is uh, taken by Peggy, and it's just. 
captures everything except for the audio part that I love about Cock the Rock. Just like the, the you can't even see the bill, just how like the the little, um, <laughs> I don't know what, what even to call that kind of like cool hairdo that comes up over the bill and just the vibrant colors. So the, the Cock the Rocks on the west side are more more red and the ones on the east side are more orange. So we did end up seeing some on the east side as well, which are kind of, yeah, like I said, more more orange. These are redder. Uh, but just the the orange red along with the black and white and they would kind of flutter and do like a little dance just incredible it did not disappoint at all and uh, any trip to ecuador you got to go and see cock the rocks it's just that was something else um wasn't just cock the rocks that were so cool though at uh, uh refugio paz de la aves uh again we had like five different species of ant pitas there uh, this one right here, uh, I, I blocked, I think it was yellow breasted ant pitta. I can't see what I wrote up there. I think that's yellow breasted ant pitta or something like that. Uh, really small one. So we had giant ant pitta there, which was like the biggest. And then this one was like one of the smallest, really cool. And then, uh, here's what they, uh, some of the pictures that, uh, Peggy captured of, um, Angel La Paz calling in for the ant pittas. And the worms that they would use or grubs that they have over here on the left. Now, the thing, uh, I didn't really bring this up while all this was happening, but to like throw out the grubs and the worms and then to use your fingers to make the call. Like, I don't know how that really worked <laughs> or how, how sanitary that was, um, but it worked. It, it definitely worked. And these ampitas would come out for us. But it also just wasn't ant pittas that would come out to these these worms and these little spots for the ant pittas. It was also uh, cool things like ant thrushes. And Scott Crabtree got a really cool um, capture of the uh, the ant thrush. And so let's watch that here on YouTube. Okay, let's watch. So they specifically put these out. You can see uh, before I started the worms here on the right. And they would usually put them on like a, a really nice photogenic moss covered log or something that we could take pictures on. And so that, that that's why this, it, it's not manicured, but it is manicured at the same time. Here we go. This is a very, very hard to see bird, by the way. And we are so blessed to be able to see it. Preparing its bill for the worm. Flicking its tail. <laughs> oh, dinner time. Actually, it was breakfast time. You can hear all the cameras going off on the background. There it goes. So awesome. All right. Let me get back to. So it's definitely uh, one of the highlights of Ecuador. Well, let me turn that off. When we first arrived. All right. Let me X out of that. <laughs> All right. There we go. Uh, but one of the really cool things all throughout the Ecuador experience was was seeing uh, the different guides call in these birds. It's really incredible. All right. Some more awesome birds from here. Uh, Flame-faced tanager. This is a, one of our introductions to um, all the different tanagers of the area. I think we saw 52 I have the number at the end. I think we saw 52 different types of tanagers throughout our two weeks, which is incredible. One of them was summer tanager, by the way. Not as exciting, but we did see a summer tanager. Um, here's a toucan barbette. Uh, it has this, I should have put the voice in here. It's got a really like booming voice, um, which was really cool to hear. But again, beautiful bird, just so much color in some of these amazing Ecuadorian birds. 
I uh, mentioned that the ant thrush was having breakfast. We loved our breakfast too. This is breakfast at Refugio de la Paz. And John, uh, this is a great capture of John. And uh, But this is probably the best breakfast that we had on the entire trip. Uh, I don't can't remember exactly what these little um, pastries right here were called, but like it was insanely good. So good. Um, other food that we had on the trip was amazing as well. Later that day, on the Indian Cock the Rock day was also Peggy's birthday. So uh, at Septimo Paraiso, they made her a special cake and we got to celebrate with her. Uh, like I said, the hospitality at these Ecuadorian lodges was just uh, off the hook. It was just so good. So the next day, uh, we went to a, a couple different spots. One of them was Amagusa Reserve. Um, and that's where we had our first taste of parrots. We had rose-faced parrots there. We had we didn't have a whole lot of parrots on the trip. We did have uh, a few, maybe like um, along with macaws. I think it was like maybe like around ten different parrots, uh, parakeets, parrotlet, macaws. Um, so once you get down to the Amazon, you get more of these. But uh, rose faced parrot was a, a delight. We had like four or five right in our face. Uh, easy pictures for me. Um, with those easy pictures don't come very often, but this one proved it proved it well. The star of the bird for me on this day, though, was glistening green tanager. Holy cow, this is a, a beauty. Um, I don't know. It's something about green birds. We had a few different green birds. Glistening green tanager, grass green tanager. Um, there was another green tanager that we saw. Uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful birds. But while that was the bird of the day for me, the weirdest bird of the day uh, was this one right here. I don't know what you would consider. Maybe that's a good question. Think about it. What is the weirdest bird you've ever seen? Ponder that for a second. This one right here was mine. So we're all looking up in these caves. There's, there's a few up here. There's a few in the back. There's even more as you go in there. But what you see right here where my arrow is at, you can just barely make out a bird. I'll show you a, a bit of a close up here in a second. Definitely the weirdest bird I've ever seen called an oil bird. Now, oil birds are nocturnal, uh, like um, night hawks, kind of. Uh, nocturnal birds that go and they feed on palm oil. So uh, they roost in either caves or like in this instance, like a very small, like kind of box canyon, like little, um, like really steep and dark canyon. And, uh, so they're very hard to find or, you know, they roost at different locations and that's where people go. This actually one of the most lit up spots, uh, to be able to see oil bird. And here's a, a bit of a close up. You can see two here, um, kind of up high on the left one of, they have huge tails and huge wingspans. It's hard to tell when they're just roosted up in these little nooks and crannies, but you can see the tail sticking out here. You can see, uh, it's friend over here on the left. But so we, we had the special spot where we went to go see these oil birds and uh, did this little trail up and walked up this pathway into this box cane. And there they were, such a strange, strange bird. So go, moving on. So we're still on the like the west slope of the Andes. And um, the next day after we went and saw the oil birds in Amagusa, we went to uh, Rio Solanche another reserve, but this one pretty special because they uh, have this big tower. And so on this tower, we were able to get closer to some of those birds that are higher up in the canopy that, you know, a lot of times we'd be looking at straining our necks up and uh, wrenching out our backs or our necks or our hips or whatever, trying to look up and see everything. But here at the tower, we we're able to kind of be a little bit more like direct with them. And so got really close to this colored air, sorry. Uh, let me play a little video. I, I like I like capturing these little videos with my phone. So let's watch this. That one. Like the fruit loop. Can you swallow it? Yep. Yep. I will try. So don't stand underneath them. No. They like to poop. <laughs> Cut that uh, that little conversation about don't stand underneath of them. They like to poop. And then sure enough, you know what happened? Just like seconds later. It did. Luckily, no one was standing in the splash zone. 
I think that was Scott maybe who warned everyone and uh, how serendipitous that was, you know, it's a uh, right timing because uh, it, it was pretty close to us. It would have, would have caused some damage to a camera or something probably. Uh, but colored air saris, you know, along with toucans, again, some of those iconic uh, South American birds that we think of. And we had a couple of different air, air saris, uh on the tour, this being the one that we got the closest view of. And uh, also had some trogans while we were there. We had white-tailed and blue-tailed trogan up on the tower at Rio Solanche. This is a female white-tailed trogan. You know, being from Southeast Arizona, we like to think that we're the trogan capital of the United States. But really, we just had the the one trogan. Well, two if you count the, uh, the ear quetzal. Um, but down in Ecuador, we had all sorts of different types of trogans. And... Uh, yeah, some of their voices sound pretty pretty similar to elegant trogan. Some of them a little different, but they they behave the same way. They like to you know just kind of get on a get on a branch and sit still for a while, flutter out and catch something and come back. Uh, but they're they're beautiful. So we had white tailed trogan, we had blue tailed trogan. Blue tailed being bigger and a little bit more similar to what we have with elegant trogan, but you can see bigger bill, more red all the way underneath. No, no white collar. Um, the tail is actually blue instead of gold on ours. Um, uh, but beautiful trogans, different ones on the east side than the west side. Also, later in the day, we also had a, a quetzal, a quetzal. Uh, later on, uh, I, um, I didn't get a good picture of that, I didn't put a picture up here, but quetzals as well down there. So, speaking of toucans and weird, cool birds like that, the next day. Our last day on the west side, we went to a really cool spot called the Bird Watchers uh, Reserve. Uh, and at the Bird Watchers place, they had an amazing setup for photography. They had a, a moth blind setup. So we'll talk a little bit about moth blinds here coming up. But they had a cool moth blind. And then they had this little fun thing that I got my picture taken with, uh, with the plate build mountain toucan. Um, thankfully, this was not the only toucan that we saw that day we, we actually saw the real thing not just the picture we did end up with plate build mountain toucan which was a star of the show um again peggy knocked out of the park with a picture here um look at and just soak in that bird for a second i mean <laughs> that's an incredible bird right plate build mountain toucan and they uh so on the back side of this branch right here were like some cutouts in this uh branch where they would put um bananas and so the toucan would kind of bend over and eat the bananas out uh, of that little insert hole and then pop up and give us pictures uh possible pictures to do so pretty amazing really cool and one of the highlights of our whole segment over on the west side of the of the andes mountains i still think andean cock the rock is better but th this one's right up there so then we it was time to go over and go back to quito and then from quito go over to the east slopes of the andes and uh had to throw in a picture of omar he's always moving our stuff from our rooms to the bus and all sorts of stuff omar was just amazing able to maneuver the bus around everywhere uh but omar uh yeah, he was he was fabulous and a great support to all of us. So I had to give a shout out to him. So on, when we were uh, headed over to the east slope of the Andes, one of the first spots that we went to was Chicana Reserve, uh, or the also known as uh, the Condor Spot. And so here's Paul and Lisa uh, celebrating the Andean condors with their their special mug. Got to take pictures of them and the in their mug at different places, but this spot was probably the coolest that we got the picture of them at. Uh, Andean condors, oh, majestic, majestic, majestic! And here's one uh, picture that Peggy got of Andean condors flying over us. We actually saw thirteen at the spot, and they're catching the thermals. And they kind of fly by on the thermals, and then they would. Um, uh, perch up in the in the cliffs far away from us so we got some scope looks at indian condors up in the cliffs as well sitting up there you can see they're like white collar here uh but it was 
you know, up until this point, been pretty warm the whole trip, but we started to get up into even higher and higher elevation. And that was another thing that was surprising to me about Ecuador was, um, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but it got fairly cold. I had to wear a jacket almost all the time, especially when we got on the east part of the Andes Mountains. And uh, so we we did the condor spot, and then we got up to our lodging uh, for two nights. This is Termas Papayacta. And the Termas Papayacta was my favorite lodge spot. They had good food, but even better was, you see, you see these cabins, right? This is where we had our, our, our rooms right off from our rooms were these amazing hot springs. And so we go birding and then we come back and get in the hot springs together and watch black chested buzzard eagles fly over us and shining sunbeams land in the flowers right by our heads as we're soaking in the, the hot, uh, hot springs with the, uh, oh man, it was, it was just amazing. I guess you had to be there, <laughs> but it, if I'm ever going to go back to Ecuador, I'm definitely staying at Termas Papiacta. It was, um, just so rewarding to be out there birding in the cold and then come back to the hot spring. And you know what? It was really cold up there. So Termas Papiacta, I'm trying to remember exactly what elevation this was at i think this was at a, at 11 or 12,000 maybe 13,000 feet something around there and then the the spot that we were going to go to the next morning was at 14,400 feet up at the top of uh that overlooked like Antisana um national park and mount Antisana uh oh yes i forgot i thought i had a picture of mount Antisana next but also not only the best lodging but they also had the best beer at Termas Papiacta. They had this uh, dark uh, IPA. Holy cow, this black IPA was so good. So I just had to throw that. That was uh, the rest of the beer choices in Ecuador were not the best, but this was definitely good. Okay. We went up to the antennas at 14,400 feet the next morning to look for Rufus Bellied Seed Snipe. And I still don't believe that they actually exist because we didn't see any. The first time you could see the, the clouds and the fog that were in, it, this, was, this wasn't even the highest point. But I'm going to play this video so you can like hear how windy it was and just kind of get a feel for how cold it was. Um, it was downright chilly. Let's play this. Oh, I just had a shiver even just looking at that. Um, and that wasn't even the worst of it. Like as you go up higher, like the fog was like all around us from the antennas up at the top. There were like these wires and all this ice was like coming down on us. And we spent probably about 10 minutes up there looking for seed snipe, trying to brave this horrible weather. Like I'm from Tucson. I can't like, it was probably only like, 35 degrees or something like that. But with the wind chill, I bet it was, I'm just saying it was probably like zero. I, I don't know that for sure, but it's how it felt like, and, uh, uh, no seed snipe. So we only had like another opportunity the next day. And, oh, here we did see chestnut wings and clodes up there. Um, not as amazing as what a seed snipe would have been. Uh, but we had the next day possibly to go up there. If it was, we were only going to go up if it was like bright and sunny and blue sky. And if that was the case, then we were going to go up there. Well, sure enough, bright, sunny, blue sky, perfect conditions to find a seed snipe. We went up to the top. We had great views of Mount Antisana. We spent probably an hour, maybe an hour and a half up there. And so it was so cold. It, I think it was even colder. Maybe that's just because we were out there longer. And it was still so windy and still no seed snipe. So like we, we saw just about everything that we thought we might see in Ecuador, except for seed snipe. That was our big miss in my opinion. Um, so I guess I'll just have to go back up there and stay at Termas Papiacta in the hot spring again to go try for it. But uh, beautiful, beautiful views of Mount Antisana and other volcanoes all around. Incredible. Um, I just wasn't prepared for the cold. So we went from 
Mount Athasana all the way down to the lowest point that we would get to out the east slope of the Andes. We went to a place called Wild Samaco, which is probably, you know, talk about what the best lodge was to stay at, Papayakta, uh, in my mind for sure. The best birding here at Wild Samaco. Wild Samaco, we had bird lists of well over like a, uh, well over a hundred bird species without even leaving the property. This is what the, um, kind of the porch will look like with hummingbird feeders out here. Just incredible spot. This is one of the hummingbirds that we had one of the fourth. So we got there fairly late in the evening and just had like maybe a half an hour before it got dark. But in that half an hour, we had 14 hummingbird species that first evening with this one right here, the gold's jewel front be the one that stood out to me the most. Uh, just incredible. Just with that huge orange, you know, just that upper chest just really stood out. But 14, I mean, we had uh, hermits and Incas and sa sapphire wings, all sorts of crazy stuff coming in there. Uh, also, so talk a little bit more about the food that we had at other, every spot. The the food at Wild Samaco was out of this world. It was so good. For every meal we would have for lunch and dinner, at least soup for every meal. All the soup was fantastic, except for the very, um, the very last day. I'll, I'll mention that here at the end. But the soup was always so good. I'm not even a soup person, but especially after being up there uh, near Mount Atasana, I needed some soup every day because I was still so cold, even though it was warmer down here at Wild Samaco. So at Wild Samaco, we had uh, more ant pittas. I'm a, this is um, a little video that I took of uh, seeing plain, plain back ant pitta. Oh, they won't work from yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Ampitas are the reason that ampitas are so important for when you get going on Ecuador. We we don't get any of those ampitas here, so it's just pretty incredible to see them. And then this is how we called in for them. How our guide called in for them. This is a video taken by by Peggy. It's coming! It's coming! Oh, it's coming! You know that anticipation. Sometimes it would take a little longer, you know, some, some spots we we're waiting for quite a while. Um, but it was really cool, especially when they could do the call just with their hands or, you know, all that, uh, again, they'd put out the worms and then they'd call with their hands. It's like, Ooh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> great job. Great job by them. I'm glad I didn't have to do that part. <laughs> um, so amphitheaters are always cool. Oh, the next day. Oh yeah, we had 145 species on the next day. Barely even left wild smako. There, I mean, there are birds everywhere. Get back from you know, kind of walking around and doing a little walk around wild smako, and we get back to that um, the um, the deck. And uh, can't remember who it was, but someone had put the scope up on this tree, and they're like, "Hey, Luke, I think you'd like to look through the scope." So I looked through the scope, and holy cow, there were Swallowtail kite or did I put scissor tail kites? Supposed to be swallowtail kites. Whoops. <laughs> uh they're not scissor tail kites, they're swallowtail kites. Um, but the swallowtail kites everywhere up in this tree. And there's an adjacent tree where they were also we had I can't I counted 69 different. Is it no and I can't even remember. Is it swallowtail or scissor tail? I think it's swallowtail. Swallowtail kites up in this tree. Just incredible. Like, that's one of my favorite raptors. And uh, for some reason, it's kind of overlooked that they would even be in Ecuador while we were there. But yeah, swallowtail kites, 69 of them. And they're just like flying around everywhere too. Just really incredible. Here's another bird that we had uh, kind of throughout the the whole trip, but one that we had uh, quite a bit at Wild Smacos, Ornate Flycatcher. One of my favorite fly catchers now. Um, it took me a little while to like figure out what it was. And like, oh, it ended up just kind of being like vermilion fly catchers, you know, like one of those beautiful fly catchers that you just see everywhere, but you still, it's just like oh, so cool to see that. Also, while we're at Wild Tamako, 
uh, I had to put this in there. I saw my 1500th life bird, which ended up being a violacious Jay. This is our guide Edison. And so we kind of celebrated. I didn't get a picture of a violacious Jay, but it's like this big blue Jay with this black hood. They're kind of far away, but it just ended up being my 1500th bird. And I was really excited about it. Um, so we got to celebrate. Oh, and it was not just birds. So we saw a lot of other animals besides birds. One of the cool animals that we saw was a huge giant earthworm. And um, I got a, a little video showing Serpa handling it as well. So let, let's watch this. This is this earthworm. We saw how many times have you ever seen an earthworm from your vehicle? And like, oh, don't run over the worm. But that, that's how we found this. Like we're driving on the road and then our driver's like, there's a worm in the road. And so we stopped for a worm. First time I've ever stopped for a worm. Here we go. Watch this. Look at this huge giant worm. Oh my God. How long is that? Uh, it's like over two feet, maybe almost three. A meter twenty. Maybe more. I got big finger. Look at. <laughs> Sorry, that's it. Okay, so how are we gonna Why? get it off the Girth ground? Girth is with bigger than my finger. Just wait, don't worry, I will book. Okay. Just pick it up. Maybe with this. Oh yeah. I I'll pick it that. up. <laughs> just the same book. Yeah, okay. Can. I wouldn't have any problems. Serpa. <laughs> <laughs> hold it, hold it up. Oh, hold it. Hold it, hold it. Hold it. Okay. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Serpa, yeah, that is rad. <laughs> so it, that was really cool. You know, we didn't pick up any snakes or anything like that, but we did pick up a worm. Figured that was a little bit safer. Went back, wash our hands, and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, lots of bird, uh, not just birds. We also had, um, we had some, uh, like a little monkey that was there at Wild Samako, and then we had like this kind of. Um, kind of like mink, um, fisher, kind of weasel-like big animal called a, a tyra. We had one of those there, so that was pretty cool. This is our view, kind of like where we were looking at those kites earlier. This is our view from Wild Samako uh, from the deck, just amazingly beautiful. From there, we went to uh, my second favorite lodge, which was called San Isidro Lodge. Uh, not only do they have uh, great food there, but they also had one of my favorite things to sit in with, uh, I had a hammock there. So I got to use that for a little bit and the room's just beautiful. This is my room at San Isidro, just with these windows, look outside and at the jungle. It's just, it was amazingly beautiful. What San Isidro Lodge is known for is there's a very special owl. So it's a black banded owl, but it's, um, almost like its own subspecies of owl here at San Isidro called the San Isidro owl. Here's a, so we're out at the deck at night, uh, waiting for a mountain taper to come in. Uh, instead of the mountain taper, we had the San Isidro owl and I got this picture of Peggy taking a picture of, of the owl. Here's a close up of the owl, just an amazing, beautiful owl, bet better than any owl we have here in North America, in my opinion, except for maybe snowy owl, snowy owl is pretty, maybe snowy owl would be above that, but this. It was a pretty incredible owl that th this is why people go to San Isidro's to find this guy. But again, not just the owl, but great food and um, so many moths there as well. So I mentioned that a lot of the different places had um, like moth blinds set up. And so they'd have a moth, this big white sheet and all these, uh, they'd shine a light on it at night. All the moths would be attracted at night. And then in the morning, it would attract the birds here at San Isidro with a lot of green jays and cinnamon flycatchers and um, smoky peewees. Um, but they'd all be attracted to this area for free food in the morning. So here's what the uh, the moth kind of thing looked like. Ooh, yeah. That? yeah. That's the San Isidro. Yeah. Oh, so they do make noise. Yeah, they go. <laughs> and I love the commentary on the video. So not only do you get a, like a, a, a like a feel for being there, but you get to hear some of the commentary as well and the imitations of San Isidro Isles. 
Uh, so this is our second to last spot to stay outside of keto. Uh, before we left there, we went for a little walk and, um, Elliot had mentioned potus earlier here. We did get three different species of potus. We had, uh, uh, great potu, common potu. And then here we have Andean potu, uh, and can you spot it? So look at this middle snag that goes up. And then right on the top of the snag, here's the Andean potu. So we actually, on our walk, we walked right by this bird. And after we walked by, one of Edison's friends drove by in a vehicle and said, hey, did you guys see the potu? And we're like, no. And he was like, want me to show you where it's at? And then, yeah, later on, right where we had just walked by. Uh, and she's actually sitting on a nest and got little... I don't know if the eggs that already hatch or like, but I know she's sitting on a nest right there, right by the road. Pretty incredible to find an Andean potu, uh, such a strange bird. If you look into potus, you'll, you'll just notice that they are not as strange as oil birds, but they're very close. So from San Isidro, we went to our last spot before Quito and we, it's right next to a river, Rio Quijos, Rio Quijos Eco Lodge. Here's a, a group picture of us uh, kind of celebrating an amazing, amazing trip next to the river. You know, one thing about Tucson that we don't have is we don't have great flowing rivers. So just being next to the river was, was amazing. It just felt so good. And there's cool birds, birds that we hadn't really seen anywhere else here, including white cap dipper and torrent duck. Now, if you know me, I'm a duck guy. I love waterfowl. Didn't get to see a whole lot, a lot of waterfowl on this trip, but this is one that was really high up on my list to see a torrent duck. They love fast flowing rivers. And, uh, I know it's not like the greatest picture in the world, but I was pretty happy about getting it, finally getting a picture of a torrent duck. Um, the female is kind of like cinnamon colored, really beautiful too. This is a male. And uh, anytime you're in South America on a really fast flowing river, big river, you're going to want to look for torrent ducks one of the best. So our very last day, we spent a day touring the city of Quito. Uh, a few of us did, a few people had to leave, leave that day, but those of us who stuck around, we got to, uh, uh, go and check out some beautiful churches and plazas right in the middle of old town, Quito, old downtown Quito. Uh, and then we also went to a museum called the middle of the world museum. It's called the middle of the world museum because Quito is right on the equator. So if you look at this picture and you see these, re this red line right here, the red line, uh, is supposedly the equator. That's the equator line. So if you look at this, you can kind of see the red line behind us right here. This was the most amazing thing. This is really the last thing. I know we're a little over noon, but hear me out. This is. Beyond birds, this is a thing that like, just like blew my mind. I'll set up this story. So you got this red line, which is supposedly the equator line. You got this basin right here. You can see there, there is a plug in here. She removed the plug. When this basin is right over that red line, I saw this with my eyes. All of us saw this with our own eyes. And, uh, basin over the red line, the plug, put water in there, put some of these little green leaves in there so you can see which way it flows and everything. When it's on the red line, all that water just goes straight down. It went straight down. There was no like whirlpool or anything. And then you can see it's just moved over maybe three feet or something like that. And three feet to the south in the southern hemisphere, when all the water was put in there and the plug was pulled out, I can't remember exactly which way it went, but it swirled to the right. And you put it three feet on the other side of that line. It all swirled to the left. Now I was sharing this with some of my friends and they said, no way that could happen. Cause like the equator line changes and all of this. I'm like, no, I saw it with my own eyes. I couldn't believe it. But this middle of the world museum was incredible. That thing stood out to me the most right on the equator. And it really did like 
change the way that the water flowed. Peggy was there. Scott was there. Paul and Lisa were there. Serpa was there. You guys can all vouch for me as well. But it, it was pretty incredible. It was just a, a pretty neat way to to end that, that whole tour, just realizing that you are somewhere that is not the United States, somewhere that is not Tucson, Arizona, somewhere like exotic. And you're there spending it with, with friends, friends who you knew before the trip or friends that you didn't even know until the trip, but um, relationships made so that it was really cool during this whole outing. So here's some final numbers uh, from the trip. Altogether, we saw 506 bird species. This picture, by the way, is taken by Scott, one of my one of my favorite pictures. That was so cool, Scott. Thanks for grabbing that. 506 bird species, 67 hummingbirds. Yeah, we're I was right. 52 different tanagers on the trip. 52 checklists. I showed this to my son. He was like, "Did you see a tanager? Every a new tanager every checklist?" I'm like, "Yeah." Yeah, that's what we did. 52 tanagers, 52 checklists, 14 days, 10 amphitas, six lodges. And here's the thing. After we went to that middle of the world museum, we went to this really, really nice restaurant, fancy restaurant. Like I said, every restaurant they serve lunch with lunch and dinner, they serve soup. So we have some different choices at this really fancy restaurant for what kind of soup we want. One of them was potato soup. And another one, our tour guide um, for the city, he was explaining it to us. He said, it's like a, like a corn-based soup that's Ecuadorian and fancy and, you know, a lot of Ecuadorians like it and we call it Cadillac soup. And so all of us, we're like, oh, that sounds good. Let's go with the Cadillac soup. And the only person who didn't get the Cadillac soup was our driver. That should have, that should have made us think a little bit. So we all get our soup and we start eating it. I mean, it looks kind of appetizing, but not, not the greatest, but anyways, I start eating it. I'm like, man, this broth, this something's wrong with this broth. And then I, you know, I can kind of see what looks like corn kind of yellow base. And then I see like this kind of gelatinous kind of clump thing in there. I'm like, what is that? Is that like a mushroom? So I take a, take a bite chew on it that's not a mushroom i don't know what that is i'm like i don't really like this but like it served to me so i got to eat it so like i took some more bites and like all of us were like ah, this something's not right about this and i'm like i'm trying to eat it and rob from saber wing rob he, he was like dude you just need to quit eating why are you still eating that I'm like ah, gotta gotta eat it but then i it, like i stopped maybe about a quarter of the way into it i was like i just can't eat any more of this we didn't have Wi-Fi at the time or anything. So like it couldn't do like due diligence. So like, what is this? So later that night, I look it up once we get some Wi-Fi. Cadillac soup, Ecuadorian soup is cow's feet soup. <laughs> it was the worst thing I ever had in my life. It was, um, uh, the rest of the food was fantastic though. <laughs> but by the numbers, one cow's feet soup. Uh, but it did not sour the trip. The trip was amazing. Saber Wing and Rob Ritma just did a fantastic job. I would recommend going with them anytime again. Um, here's a Blue Wing Mountain Tanager for effect. But also, like, where are we going next? You can go to our international tours on our website. You can see that we already have a trip planned with them to go to Panama next year. I know a few people who are on the Ecuador trip are going to be doing that Panama trip as well. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be on that trip. Our executive director, Melissa Fratello, will be the Tucson Audubon ambassador for that. We're looking at 2025 to go to Guatemala, which I would be going on. That's not uh, all put together yet, but that is something. Uh, and then we uh, have other national tours as well with with other companies, uh, with Victor Emanuel Nature Tours and with um, Nationalist Journeys. So you can check those out as well. Um but again, Ecuador was fantastic. It was amazing. I want to go back. I want to go back. So thanks for uh, being a part of the talk. I know we went over a little bit. I have some time for questions. If anyone wants to, to ask anything and we can go from there. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, that was even more fascinating than I expected. So thank you so much. All right. Well, that's good. Um, and we, you know what, it was really, uh, really an active chat. So thanks everybody for that. It's always fun when we have that interaction going on in the chat. Um, I've got a few questions for you. Um, Nancy, who is joining us from London. So good evening to you, Nancy, and thanks for being here. Um, she had a couple of questions and one of them you kind of addressed. Um, she asked, um, were feeders put out for the hummingbirds or did you see them in your natural habitat? And I know you showed us that one lodge that had a lot of the feeders. Was that kind of typical of the experience or just kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, very typical. So uh, the feeder stations are the best spots to find the hummingbirds. We definitely saw hummingbirds in their natural settings, but holy cow, it was uh, much harder to pick those out and to identify them. Uh, at least for me, it was, you know, easier for Edison or Rob since they've been there before. Um, but to see them out of the context of a hummingbird feeder, it was, it was much more difficult. Uh, but some hummingbirds like Jeffrey's dagger bill, they don't come into hum uh, the feeders. Um, oh, the, um, there was another one, not a hermit. What was it? It was a sickle bill. Um, I think it was white whiskered sickle, sickle bills don't come into the feeder. So we had to look for these, uh, uh, these red flowers that were kind of like cylinder shaped and that they would come to and, and look for them there. Oh, I also, I, I got to share um, another really awesome picture of a hummingbird that we got. Um, so actually one that uh, Jake, Jake went, got an amazing picture of a tawny bellied hermit. Check that out. Like, right. He took that with his phone, like right in front of his face at one of the feeders. <laughs> that <laughs> awesome i just had to share that as uh i was thinking about that but yeah most of uh, all the different hummingbird feeders there just made that a lot easier excellent then a second question from nancy um what time of day did you see the was it the white fronted owl you had the picture of it looked like it was in the afternoon so what time of day was that yeah amazingly i don't know how they found it but they found a, a roosting spot way up in the hill in the hills uh for this this screech owl and so before we went and made this undulating hike up to the screech owl they sent someone out there to see if it was still roosting there for the day and sure enough it was i think we were uh excited that it was roosting up there but also a little bit hesitant because we, we could kind of tell that it was going to be a little bit of a hike to get up there it was worth it uh but yeah it was during the day probably like around 10 o'clock something like that and by the way nancy i'm so glad i was just thinking of you the other day i'm so glad you're on the on the call today. Hope you're doing well. Excellent. Thanks, Luke. Um, another question from Annis. I hope I'm saying that right. She's joining, they're joining us from Bend, Oregon. Um, and you talked about the oil birds, um, that they, they eat the palm oil. And I know that with palm oil plantations, there's been a lot of environmental degradation with that. Did y'all see any palm plantations? And if so, was that something that was addressed by the guide at all about the environmental impact that those have? We talked about that for sure. We didn't see any really big plantations. I think they, they actually fly pretty far to where they go and, and feed. Um, but yeah, we did talk about that a lot as we were going to see them. And um, yeah, they so they um, they used to be killed a lot at the palm oil spots because uh, I'm probably I'm probably misremembering a little bit of what happened, but. I know that um, people who own those plantations would kill oil birds because they thought that it was, there's was something going on there. Um, but thankfully that, that doesn't happen anymore that I, that I know of or that we talked about. Excellent. Thank you again. Um, Ken asked a question. Um, I know you're talking about some of those elevation numbers were pretty high up there. What were the, did you have any breathing issues um, while you're out and about or just kind of how was the overall comfort level being that high up? I mean, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm younger, right? So I'm like 43. I could feel it a little bit. Um, it, it didn't hamper me as much, but you know, if I'm feeling it, like other people are feeling it as well. And so, like, I know that some folks had a harder time. It definitely changed the way, you know, I thought about uh, hiking or thought about like how far I could go or what I should be carrying. Um, so yeah, uh, being up that high does really affect what you're able to do, no matter what age you are. Um, but depending on your physical level, you know, it affects people differently. 
Uh, but you could, it was noticeable. I, I, yeah, I imagine. Um, let's see, Catherine had a question and she was wondering um, how long were your days and kind of specifically what, what were the start times each morning? Some, some mornings we did have to start really early, especially like for the cock, the rock, we had to be there at a certain time to get to the lek when they were calling. Cause they would only be like really busy in there for like a four, 30 to 60 minute window. And so I think on that day we had four o'clock, four thirty, kind of rings a bell is what time we had to get to the bus. Uh, most mornings we're out and about by six o'clock. Um, you know, the, being on the equator, uh, the sunrise and the sunset doesn't really change much at all. I think it's, I think Rob was saying it's like a 30 second change throughout the whole year. Uh, so those times were pretty much set for us. Uh, but just like anywhere else, like the birding is, is best in the morning. That's when the birds are most active. So we would start early, um, have lunch usually out, uh, on site somewhere and then get back to the lodge, like around four o'clock or four thirty, have time for rest, cerveza, dinner, uh, go to sleep, kind of do our our evening uh get together where we talk about the birds and all that. That's kind of like the rhythm of the day most of the time. Uh if we were going to a different lodge, we would drive during that kind of um that middle hour and stop at different spots. Um yeah it wasn't it wasn't a, a really slow pace trip but it wasn't super like all the time going 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 there was options for people to stay back and stuff too if they needed to sounds like a lot of fun and then the last question that i have at least from the chat um tina i know you put some just kind of numbers that the whole group got there at the end um tina was curious how many lifers that you got personally while you were on the trip so of the 508 species, I think I had 458. So like there's a good 50 that I missed, I believe, uh, whether they were herd only or whether I, I just missed some. Uh, I know there was an ant pitta that I was too impatient. And I didn't wait for, so I left. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I ended up with like 458 species. And then I think there was, I think it was 390 for life birds for me wow <laughs> that's a heck of a trip um let's see that's all i've got from the written questions um if anyone has a question that they would like to ask luke themselves um go ahead and invite you to unmute yourself and um feel free to ask your question in the meantime while we're waiting i'll say to me the what was it the glistening green tanager and then the jewel-fronted hummingbird were uh, spectacular. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was looking at when I saw those pictures. Gold's jewel front. Gold's jewel front. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, I I'm glad they butchered the name of that <laughs> because I was butchering names of birds all the time. So whether it's breasted or chested or rufous or, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> all these different <laughs> colors and different parts of the bird and uh, actually all the different, like whether it's a foliage gleaner or a tree hunter or a wood creeper, holy cow, it's just like all over the place. Um, so I'm glad you butchered the name because I, I did yeah. quite a bit, bit of that myself too. I have or, a quick question though. Yeah, Kathy. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. So uh, when you go through Tucson and a commercial outfit that does birding, does, is it a package deal where they take care of your airfare or are you still flying there and it doesn't start at keto? I just wondered how it all works. Yeah, Kathy, that's a great question. So uh, this tour, uh, along with others that we do as Saberwing and most of our international partners, international tour partners, is uh, you pay them for taking care of everything during the trip. So from when you land in keto to when you leave keto, the thing that's not covered in that is the airfare from... Tucson to Quito or wherever you're going, uh, mm -hmm. flying from. So that airfare is usually not covered on those. That's a norm. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how it works, but everything else except for alcohol is covered during the tour. Usually. Did, did they also give you advice about visas and immunizations? 
yeah, uh, Rob, Rob would work with you and work with all of us to like give us some advice on what he would do as far as all those different things. Uh, we didn't have to get a visa. We just had to have our, um, our passport and there wasn't a whole lot of different immunizations that you would need to go to Ecuador, thankfully. Great. Thank you very much. And I, yeah. thanks for, for a great thing. I haven't done that. It feels really intense and kind of overwhelming. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, the best part about it, I think, uh, going with Tucson Audubon is that, you know, you're, you have a better idea of who you're going with, you know, like-minded people, a community of people that you're already a part of. And so if you're a single person going on one of these trips, mm -hmm. it can be really intimidating because you don't know anyone. Who am I going to be with? But at least this helps, you know, sure. that process a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. Mark, I see your hand. Hi, hi, Luke. Um, hey. hey, great presentation. I was kind of curious about um, Ecuador. Is it kind of like a real destination birding place in South America? Is is it um, is the economy, I mean, kind of an important part of, of the tourist economy? Yeah, yeah. The tourism economy in Ecuador, especially when it comes to ecotourism, is huge. And so there's all sorts of uh private reserves, uh, different uh, nature-based groups that are uh, doing things there. It, what's incredible is like, I actually had um, a few friends from my gym going to Ecuador at the same time I was there, not on a, you know, Audubon trip, but it was a nature kind of adventure base going to Ecuador and they do that quite often as well. So not just the, the birding part, part of it, but the nature kind of ecotourism base of economy for Ecuador is, is huge. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, along with, um, maybe Peru, Chile, Brazil, like it's uh, Colombia. Those are, those are all really well-known spots in South America where a lot of bird, birding tours happen. Thanks. Looks like Karen has their hand raised. So Karen, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question, please feel free. Uh, I was just going to enhance that Ecuador is also the, quote, owner of the Galapagos Islands. So the country is pretty designed for tourism. Uh, and uh, having done a tour like a bit like Luke did, uh, we got further um, west than he did many, many years ago. Uh, even then, you know, is, the Galapagos are part of Ecuador, so they're they're pretty well set up to, for natural nature tours. And it, I, way back when, I felt perfectly safe there, and I generally suspect that Luke did and the group did too. It, it seemed like a pretty nice place to be. So just adding that thought. Yeah, that's right, Karen. Uh, Galapagos is part of Ecuador. Unfortunately, it wasn't part of our trip, but uh, it's a very important uh, ecotourist location where people. I, I, yeah, a lot of, a lot of tour companies do well going to, to Galapagos and you walk into the Quito airport and you can tell right away that, Hey, this is a country that's based on tourism. Um, uh, oh, Elizabeth asked in the, in the chat, how much yeah. studying do you think he did before going? Not enough, <laughs> not enough. Um, I would say if you want to talk about studying, you got to talk to Peggy Steffens. Holy cow. Peggy had a really cool system of, uh, she made like a, it's kind of like a, a match, not a matching game, but like this, um, a game on her iPad with like a picture of a bird that you could see in Ecuador. And you had to guess like which bird it was and swipe in. It, it would tell you whether you got mm -hmm. it right or not. The photo quizzes on eBird are, are really helpful. I, you know, I, I did a few of those, not enough. Um, uh, it, how about those of you who also went on the trip? I, I think I saw David and I, I saw Scott, I saw Serpa, Paul and Lisa on here. Did you guys, any other studying that, uh, worked for you? Uh, I tried to survey the birds using the, uh, the list, uh, and birds of the world, but, uh, it's hard that way. I mean, you don't know which ones you're likely to see. I mean, I looked up puff birds and we didn't see any and jacamars would have been good. We didn't see any. And uh, there's like 200 types of tyrant flycatchers. 
So <laughs> I should have spent more time, you know, looking at those. Nah, nah, it's better to look at Jack Mars and Puff Birds. It's all right. <laughs> David, you did a great job of um, in the field, Merlin and the Ecuador pack would allow you to um, see the birds. So while we were birding, you just did a great job of pulling up yeah. the bird and looking at it. So you were great at that. Yeah, I'd, I'd suggest if you're going to go to any of these places that you um, update your Merlin with the birds of that country or that region. Ecuador is in two different parts, but Colombia, you know, there's five different subsets you could download. And uh, yeah, you can learn a lot from from those. They've got good photos and you can look up a class of birds and get the thumbnails. So that'd be a good tool. Yeah, what, what I did is um, Scott had sent me a link uh, for birding in Ecuador in 2016 some videos um i but it was totally overwhelming <laughs> but that was very at least kind of prepared me how overwhelming the trip was going to be in terms of bird species it was pretty overwhelming <laughs> totally worth it <laughs> Kathy, still I... trying to digest it yeah <laughs> <laughs> hi luke hey kathy Oh, hi. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Or I Yeah, I can anyway. see you. Oh, okay. I can't see myself. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just wondered, um, was there a reason why um, this tour group chose this this time of year to go? Is there one season of the year that would be better to go to Ecuador? Yeah, good question. So there's really not seasons in Ecuador since it's on the equator. It's um, oh. There's no uh, winter, okay. spring, fall, summer. But they do have a, a very rainy season and a less rainy season. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we it... went during the less rainy season. Okay. That's, I just, yeah. Kind of wonder. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. And we just got rained on a couple of times. Um, yeah. Not too bad, really. I didn't have to use my raincoat too much. How about footwear? You know, I saw your, one of the guides, uh, they're the one that was, uh, um, he had boots on. So did people have wet feet a lot of the time or, you know, do you advise like waterproof, you know, shoe, hiking shoes? Yeah. So most of the trails yeah. we were on were, or roads were fairly well maintained. There's a few muddy spots, you know, where it'd be good to have boots on, um, at, um, wild Samaco and San Isidro, they had, um, the possibility of like, um, using boots there, like big rubber boots like if it was like really wet um which sometimes you certainly would need to uh thankfully it wasn't so muddy and rainy that we had to use any of that um you do want to make sure you have good footwear so that when you're you know walking uphill or downhill um that it's not going to cause any um like uh you know issues with your toes or anything like that i know scott had some issues with some of his boots that he had um so you just want to make sure they're well worked in and um, okay. maybe bring an extra pair um but uh yeah and most of the time i was okay. in my my running shoes okay thank you yeah. yeah i brought my boots i brought some boots but I hardly even warm they're more heavy in my bag than anything okay. um yeah thanks well, yeah, for sure, Kathy. Well, it's good to see all of you guys. I think um, you know, if you got if if any other questions rise up, if you have a question about international tours with us or about Ecuador itself or like uh any anything like that, just feel free to reach out to me. And um uh, it was great uh to see some of the, the people who are on the tour on the talk with us. Thanks uh to those of you who, who shared your your insight or pictures and all that. Um, it's awesome. Great to see all of you and, uh, hope to, hope to see you again soon. Cool. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, like I said, a lot of people have, uh, said some really nice things in the chat. Um, so before we wrap up, I always like to remind people of our mission here at Tucson Audubon is to inspire people to enjoy and protect birds. Um, and it sounds like they did a lot of that down in Ecuador. So it sounds like a wonderful trip. 
And again, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I will send out for all of you that signed up, you'll get a follow-up email from me today that will have a link to the YouTube video. Like I said, if you miss anything, or if you want to go back and watch a specific part, all the virtual presentations that we ever do, we have those on our YouTube channel as well. So there's a, tons and tons of information on there. Um, and so, like I said, with that, um, we'd like to go ahead and wrap up today's talk. And if you'd like to unmute yourself and thank Luke one last time, I know he appreciates that. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Thanks, Great. Luke. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much. For sure. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Gracias. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Luke. Bye. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.